Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to GSLP headquarters in Irish Town, where we're holding the second of our uh, twice daily press conferences as we flesh out the ideas that we've contained, uh, set out in our manifesto uh, in relation to different uh, topics every day. Uh, this afternoon, we're dealing with the first part of our environmental commitments for the next uh, four years of government. If people were to choose us at the general election on next Thursday, the 17th of October. Um, and we're going to try and give you some of the detail behind the already very detailed plans contained in our manifesto. We're going to try and uh, tell you some of the more exciting aspects of what it is that we're planning to do. The cover of our manifesto is uh, telling you that we can deliver a green Gibraltar and a child-friendly city. That comes by linking together all of the aspects of what we are proposing to do under many different manifesto uh, coverage areas. But the key area, of course, is our commitment to the environment, a commitment which we've demonstrated not just in what we are proposing to do going forward, but also in the context of what we have done since 2011. Goodness knows there is a lot still to do. Gibraltar is not as sustainable as it should be. Gibraltar is not yet as green as it should be. But when you compare the Gibraltar of today, of 2011, to the, to the Gibraltar of 2011, eight years ago, we have come on leaps and bounds. Why have we done that? How have we been able to achieve that? Because the man I designated in 2011 to be Minister for the Environment is Mr. Environment, a man who had spent his life dedicated already to the pursuit of the sustainability of Gibraltar before it was politically fashionable to do so. And so with that level of credibility, I give you Mr. John Cortez. Thank you very much, Fabian. Yes, this is a first of two. Um, I'm going to be talking mainly today about climate change, uh, air quality and energy. And there'll be other things. Uh, be, uh, before we finish, I'll tell you what the main subjects next week will be. Um, one of the things that um, Fabian has alluded to now is, is how um, much uh, the environment is now in the front line of politics. This is something that was beyond my wildest dreams nine years ago, started to become achieve, uh, achievable when our first manifesto of 2011 already had more about the environment. Um, our first manifesto that we got elected under, of course, had more about the environment than any other manifesto before. And now, our manifesto is the Green Gibraltar Manifesto. Uh, one of the interesting things in this election is that the three uh, groups who are contesting it seem to be trying to outdo each other in how environmental they are. Um, and the other two clearly are trying uh, and failing, I think, to outdo us. For me, that is already a victory, because having the environment as high on the political agenda as it is now is a huge achievement for myself, I think, if I can give myself that, that, that credit, and for those others who were with me in those lonely days, maybe a decade ago. The fact that the Chief Minister of Gibraltar produced a video uh, just a few days ago highlighting how important the environment is to the government and to Gibraltar and to the party was something quite beyond my wildest dreams when I used to sit in budget sessions when the former chief minister didn't even mention the environment once in his budget addresses. So we've come a long way. Uh, I personally have done a lot in my life, but the support that I have had from Fabian and from all my colleagues, sometimes we try and outdo each other in green as well. Uh, is incredible and is, uh, and, and is a testament to the commitment of the GSLP Liberals. I'm going to take you through today and show you how our environmental manifesto has much more substance than any other. We are the only ones who mention and who say that throughout the whole of our four years in office, if Gibraltar chooses us next Thursday, we are going to have the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals at the heart of everything we do. We've already done a lot in these areas. Um, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water. All these things that we take for granted are actually things that other communities aspire to. We have already achieved a lot of those and they are the backdrop of everything that we do. No other party probably even knows that these sustainable development goals exist, if I may be so bold. 
we have seen already unprecedented progress. Climate change, for example, is on the agenda as never before. The world is crying out. Young people are crying out. And we are there with them. I have marched with the young people down Main Street to make that point. We are going to achieve a green Gibraltar, a child-friendly city. And one of the things that we are going to do is introduce a Wellbeing and Future Generations Act, which will set in our law what we have to look forward to to ensure that future generations uh, are looked after, and that all the new developments that, th that society and that technology is bringing are dealt with in a proper way. We will make sound environmental governance a requirement within the Gibraltar Constitution. As we lose the supranational uh, entity, which is the European Union, which guarantees basic environmental rights and basic environmental protection, we must ensure that Gibraltar goes even further uh, and in, in, enshrines it in its constitution, like other countries like uh, France and even Spain have uh, in regards to the environment. And we will maintain environmental uh, legislation, EU legislation, in a dynamic way. One of the key uh, achievements of the GSP Liberal government has been the climate change motion. Um, this uh, sets down its targets to be carbon neutral by 2030, emissions down by 50% by 2035. We were the second parliament anywhere in the world to pass such a motion. We were beaten uh, by the UK parliament by just a few days. So one thing they have been able to agree on in the past uh, year and a half, which is no bad thing for the uh, United Kingdom and indeed the rest of the world. About the only thing. About the only about thing the only they've thing. been able to agree on, which is no bad thing. Another thing which is unprecedented in Gibraltar is the fact that we passed a Climate Change Act. Now, at the television debate um, just a few days ago, uh, both uh, representatives from the other two parties were trying to play down the significance of this. Uh, I can tell you that this is hugely significant. It is binding in law. It makes it a legal requirement for us to look after our environment in relation to climate change. The Climate Change Act ensures that we have a legal requirement to reduce emissions by 42% by 2030 and by 100% by 2045. This is, as you can see there, set in law as a 2045 target. And that is at least 100% lower. So this is the minimum that we set out in law that we have to achieve. There are obligations by public bodies to reduce emissions, strict regulations which will now be introduced if we're elected to reduce impact of activities on carbon emissions, waste, plastic, etc. The minister is obliged to review those targets in consultation with the Independent Climate Change Committee and report to Parliament. And there's an overriding objective. The aim of this act shall be to protect the climate for the present and future generations and to assist in the taking of preventative and remedial measures against climate change. That is set in the law of Gibraltar. Nobody else had the courage to bring that forward, and we have done so, and others are trying to play this down. I don't think they actually understand what we've done. So we're creating a climate change committee, which will include internationally renowned experts, and the climate change fund, where we have already committed in the manifesto to allocate one million pounds as a start. I'm not going to go through absolutely everything uh, on this. I'm going to leave, we will be uh, sending out this uh, presentation so you can pick things out. But I will highlight a few things. When it comes to emissions, Waterport now largely shut down. South District power stations just shut down. The GST, and this is something they kept very quiet, had to seek an EU derogation so that they continue polluting. They had to accept that they would never be able to achieve EU levels in emissions of nitrogen dioxide, and therefore they sought a derogation so that Gibraltar would not be fined millions of pounds and they could carry on polluting. And then they wanted to build another diesel power station which would not have solved the problem. We came in, we halted that plan, and we reversed that and set up the North Mole LNG power station. Remember the election four years ago, where everything that Trevor Hammond could speak about is how horrible LNG was going to be and how we were going to blow up half of Gibraltar? The other day on television, he actually said it wasn't a bad thing. Now, if somebody can have the whole, the whole campaign run on something which was clearly false, 
How can they be trusted to even understand issues of environment for the future? Our uh, generating uh, engines produce 44% less carbon. Already over 75% of our power comes from LNG. It'll be 100% by the end of this year. We've already uh, received 20,471 cubic meters of LNG and saved one and a half million pounds since January. And when we do away with the rental engines, we will be saving 6.25 million pounds a year thanks to these measures. And the savings from a, a whole year effect of LNG will be a lot more than one and a half million, probably nearer three million at least. We have um, put in energy efficiency legislation, measures to reduce a reduction in energy in public, uh, in public lighting. All public projects use NED, LED. And Aquajib announced earlier this week, the, the Fabian and I were there, uh, that they have uh, changed all their reverse osmosis um, pumps to reduce energy by 30%, which is equivalent to about 8,800 kilograms of carbon dioxide per day per pump. Uh, and, and I am told that we're not reacting to the climate emergency, that we're not doing anything about it. This is absolute proof that we were reacting to the climate emergency even before we declared it. Already, uh, a lot of the things that the, the other parties are putting forward is uh, uh, wish lists. Wish lists telling us to do things that we are already doing. For example, they say um, we should have smart meters. We have already installed 4,000 smart meters, and as soon as the software is ready, they will start to operate. So don't let anyone tell you we're not responding to the emergency. This is an interesting graph. This shows how much carbon we emit in our power stations. If you follow it, and I'm going to do my, when I used to do, when I used to lecture about these things, you can see that back in 2008, it was at this level. It started to increase when it's, it came down slightly in 2011. And this is when we didn't have enough, enough uh, generating capacity, and we had to hire in turbines, and we had to hire in temporary generators, and we had to uh, reset to make sure that there was enough capacity so that we wouldn't have power cuts, not because somebody cuts a cable, or because the junction is so old that it falls apart, but because they didn't have enough generation in the first place. So our emissions peaked there as we settled down. Then they fell sharply once we got the measure of it. Then we had the fire incident at Waterford Power Station when we had to kick in the other temporary generators and our emissions started to rise. But once we resolved that, they have fallen steadily down to a level in 2018, which is approximately the level in 2008. Now, we have dropped our emissions back to 2008 levels, despite the fact that Gibraltar has grown and developed so much. And even before, we started generating with LNG. So that's still with diesel. And we are down back to 2008 level. No country in the world, no city in the world will have achieved what we have achieved. Y después que diga. Now, for the first time ever, our government started looking at our carbon footprint. No other government ever thought about carbon footprint. Now we regularly have measures of our carbon footprint. And they have to be uh, calculated. And this graph shows very, very simply uh, a combination of state stationary energy, which is essentially power production, transport energy, which is in blue, the energy from the disposal of waste, and then other plants uh, and installations in purple. And these are uh, results that um, consultants have produced and show very clearly that largely because of our efficiency in power generation, even before LNG, our carbon footprint has dropped successively between 2015 and 2017. We're expecting the 2018 figures soon. So once again, we have shown that even without LNG, it's dropping. We have also been told that all this about climate emergency and the Climate Change Act is just palabras al viento, that we don't really mean it. Well, I can show you now that we have actually got plans and strategies going forward. This is a summary of our 
scenario one, our minimum ambition in order to reduce our carbon footprint. The new power station, which has already happened, increase renewable energy, more about that in a minute, uh, buildings to be near zero, smart metering, measures in transport, wastewater treatment, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Um, so we already know the strategies we have to take. If you look at these charts, and once again, this is how energy consumption is supposed to increase. And these are the different uh, elements, private building energy, uh, electricity generation. So this is what we have to do away with in order to get to our target. Our target is that instead of energy uh, of emissions going up in that direction, we actually come in this direction to meet our 2050 and 2045 targets. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but we already know where we have to save in power generation, where we have to save in, in, in transportation, and so on. The details aren't important. And there are, I'm not going to go because I could give a whole lecture for, for an hour and a half. This will be in the presentation. So here we are um, telling you that we already know what we have to do. And these are the different actions like LNG, increasing renewables, and that will drop our emissions by that much if we take those actions. That's more or less what I'm trying to say. I'm going to go through them just to show you. Then we have scenario two. If we want to drop it even further, what more do we have to do? Well, we switch faster to renewable, we uh, increase the, the, the smart metering, and so on and so forth. I'm just going to go very quickly through these. I don't want to bore you, but it just shows that we actually have a strategy. We have a plan. It's not just words. I'm going to carry on now <clears throat> on to what we're doing on renewables. The first of a series of solar inst installations is now producing power. We have one plant which is equivalent to about 2.5% of demand, which is enough for 350 homes and saves 3,500 kilograms of carbon dioxide per day. And there are other smaller plants. Now, somebody told me again in the debate, oh, but if we've only gone up to 5% in this time, then it's going to take all that much time. No, but this doesn't go up like that. Once we have a new plant, it will go up in steps. And by the end of next year, we estimate with all the plants that are being uh, prepared now, on St. Joseph's School, on the university, in the air terminal area, that it will go up to 5 kilowatts, which is about a quarter of our average consumption. Therefore, we will hit the 20% in 2020. Let's go on to air quality, which is related to carbon emissions. Um, our LNG plants... Uh, produce almost 100% less particles, 99% less sulfur dioxide, 90% less nitrogen oxide. Our air quality monitors detect a decrease in pollutants, a real decrease in pollutants. Okay, you're going to tell me, air quality isn't what it should be. Of course it's not what it should be. Sometimes I walk and I can smell uh, engines. Of course this is going to happen. We aren't where we want to be, but we have tackled the, what was the major problem four years ago and eight years ago. Power generation. We have to deal with the others. I'm coming to that now. But I can tell you figures. This is our, our, one of our monitors in Bleak House and in Roger Road. And these graphs show 24-hour means year on year of particulate matter, PM10. It's going down. This is PM2.5, the smaller particles which are the dangerous ones. It's going down. It be well below the EU level. This is a WHO level which no one anywhere... Uh, can, can reach in any urban area, but we are getting very, very close to the WHO level. Incidentally, the publications of WHO, which say Gibraltar's pollution was sky high, are based on 2013 data, which collects 2012 and 2011 data, so it's old data, so it's not relevant. There was a little blip here, but the trend is down. And again, the annual means of nitrogen dioxide in the three sites, Bleak House, Roja Road, Withams Road, going down. The automatic, uh, this is more, uh, all, the, all the different stations together, the three of them are showing decreases in emissions of nitrogen dioxide. In Withams Road, it's going down. That red line is the EU level. For the first time ever in 2018, we were below the EU level, without the EU derogation of the GSD. Roja Road, the, the circle shows this year's data, which is provisional, again, the trend is down, well below EU levels. This is a trend this year, in the three sites, going down. And this shows you the derogation of the GST. 
These sticks in four years are false sticks. The EU said, okay, as you, you can't reach these standards, we'll let you have higher levels. So they take it, but they were in fact breaches. If we hadn't had the derogations, those would have been red crosses. So we've had problems in the past. The first year that we have, without the derogation and without LNG, hit ticks in every single pollutant, 2018, our strategy worked. We have taken more steps. We have new air quality monitors, uh, air quality monitors in the North District. We are going to move the Withams Road now that we stopped the generation there to the north, so we can uh, track it more uh, closely. We have an air quality action plan, which is published. So I can show you here our air quality action plan. We are creating an air quality commission, and we will pass or take to Parliament, if we are elected, of course, a Clean Air Act to make clean air a legal requirement in Gibraltar. Traffic. Uh, my colleague Paul will have spoken about a lot of this, and we work very closely together on all of this. Electric vehicles, the registration of electric cars, the, 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 the farewell to the internal combustion engine, cycle lanes, walk the wall, the deployment of the SCTPP, government vehicles being electric unless it we can't find anyone that will do. And then, so because we did away with power generation as the main pollutant, now we have to deal with traffic. I briefly covered it there. And shipping is the other one. A lot of the shipping isn't within our control. If you look at some uh, information that was on the internet a week or two ago, showing maps and saying that Gibraltar was the, most, the second most polluted port in the world, you've got to look and read. It's a scientific paper. You've got to analyze it. That is based on 10 kilometers squares. 10 kilometers from Gibraltar will include the whole Bay of Gibraltar, including the port of Algeciras, and part of the Straits where there is a lot of shipping going through, which has nothing to do with us. So that is not a true reflection of Gibraltar. I have to put it there. We still have too many emissions as a result of shipping. So we've already drafted the law to regulate black smoke from ships. We're going to uh, provide shore power. We will require shore power at, at jib dock. We will introduce all international measures required by the International Maritime Organization. Uh, we're encouraging the move to LNG. Um, even though when we've done it, the GSD has said, oh, how horrible, you shouldn't be doing this. And then they say, you know, you're polluting too much. Vapor recovery technology, um, reviewing the anchoring sites again, because we've already reviewed them in the past. And we will require JIPDOC to change its practices further, or we will replace the function. And we've said that quite clearly in our manifesto. And I say we will review the anchoring sites, because these are no anchoring sites which we introduced. And there were two reasons for this. One was to protect reefs, and that's why we've got these out here. And another one was to make sure that shipping was away. The, what we are considering now is extending this further so that ships from the southwest will be further from the shore. But that is the second step. We already did this, I think it was in 2013 or 2014. Committed to a green Gibraltar, we have already shown our plans for the jib dock area. And going now on to something that I'm going to concentrate more on in next, my next presentation, green areas, how we have saved Grand Parade, or in the process of saving it, and introduce these green lungs. And we will recover El Campito of, uh, of, Laguna, of Laguna and Glasses area. And our green lung. Uh, again, Trevor Hammond, uh, in the debate the other day, um, saying, oh, this is just tall. How can you call it a green lung? Trees don't absorb that much carbon dioxide. And now he's creating a stink about one palm tree in a place where 80 mature trees are going to go. Um, so, so what is this all about? Of course, parks and green areas are good, not just for air quality, but for health and for mental health. There are statistics that show that urban areas with more trees and more parks actually have lower instances of mental health problems. So this is part of the whole well-being um, generations um, um, policy of the GSLP Liberals, the walk the wall, showing that we can do these things. And then going completely, I've got two or three points before I finish. I, I do realize I've been going on a long time, but, but I have a lot to say. Recycling quantities. 
And in, in 2011, when I became Minister for the Environment, you couldn't recycle paper and cardboard in Gibraltar. Uh, it, it was just not possible. Um, and yet the, we introduced it shortly after. And in 2011, there was zero recycled because you couldn't. There were no facilities to do it. To, 2018, two and a half million kilos of paper have been recycled in Gibraltar. And I have to thank the community for responding because they do respond to that. Batteries couldn't be recycled uh, until we introduced it. The, uh, the, 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 what we know as we, the waste electronic equipment, couldn't be recycled until we introduced it in 2013. This was all just being thrown away with the trash. And our figures have rocketed. Because this is responsible government. This is making changes happen. So I really cannot accept those who now are trying to teach us what we have to do that actually we've already done. I, I think a little bit of reference to the sewage plant. In 16 years, the GSD did nothing at all about the sewage plant. We had to come in and start from scratch. We had the site. We had to go out to tender. The tender was awarded. There wasn't the technology that could take not just the salt water, but the big changes in salinity from the salt water system to when you get a storm and the whole sewage system becomes fresh. Bacteria will die if they're not specialized to do that. So we were able to find that. Then we were awaiting funding from the EIB which took a long time to negotiate, and just before the final stage, it withdrew supporting UK territories following the Brexit referendum. But nevertheless, we awarded the advanced works contract, which has been executed. Preparatory works have been done in the Europa Point area, and the design was submitted. It's been set back for review because we thought it was too visually impacting, and we are awaiting this to come back. On plastics, we were the first to legislate in a lot of areas on plastic. I won't go. And uh, Lewis Pugh, the UN Ocean Champion, has tweeted and sent personal messages. Superb news. Microbes are having a devastating effect on our oceans. Great to see Gibraltar again leading on environmental protection. And again, more world leading legislation from Gibraltar to protect wildlife from plastic pollution and to protect our children's future. And in a personal message, I believe you are the first nation to do this, to think that only a few years ago, you had one of the largest balloon releases in the world. It's so wonderful to see you leading the world in ocean conservation. I could never have imagined that this could all happen so quickly. Very much looking forward to see you at the Allen Games. Sadly, he wasn't able to come. So this is what Louis Pugh, the guy who swam the channel, the guy who, who talks to the Queen, the guy who, who, who lectures in the United Nations, is saying. So what do you believe, him or Trevor Hammond and Craig Sakharin? I'd rather believe Louis Pugh. That's it. Next time, green areas, nature conservation, dogs and animal welfare, environmental legislation, international involvement, marine conservation, and fishing. And I have lots of things to say about fishing. So there we go. Because we care, because you know we will, and the Alameda Gardens to end up. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, John. That sort of inspirational address is what we get on Monday mornings in the cabinet. That's what drags us along and makes us realize that we can achieve to make Gibraltar a leader, to make it different. That's what's delivered the sorts of results that John has been able to talk to us about today. Delivering a green Gibraltar is not just about the parks that you see in our manifesto, the Walk the Wall project, all of these magnificent uh, projects which will make Gibraltar greener in aspect, but this is also about the underlying substance of the environmental debate, the sustainability, the climate change aspects of it. There is only one man who understands those things in detail in the context of this general election debate. There's only one candidate that has the credentials, the scientific understanding and the ability to deliver on these underlying points of substance which matter to the environment, and that is John Cortez. Thank you very much, John, for that you, insight David. this afternoon. Thank you.